Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Patreon podcast. I'm Tarek. I'm Marco. And you're listening to episode 14 or season 2, episode 4. Yeah, whatever you want. Or if you're listening to it of order. Episode 1. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us again. The Page One podcast is all about speaking to your favourite writers and maybe some writers you haven't heard of before to find out about how they broke into the industry how they make a living out of writing and what their process is and just chatting to them about their work and hopefully yeah. having a bit of fun. And hopefully you guys can learn some tips and tricks that you can use yourself on your own writing. Yeah, I certainly have. And let's be honest, that's why we started this, <laughs> <laughs> to try and get tips for our own writing. This week we have Christopher Golden, who is a very prolific, award-winning author, screenwriter, comics writer, video game writer. He's Name a writing, I think he's done it. Yeah, he's written essays, he's, yeah, anything, anything that you can write. 105 books. 110 books. 110 books? It's 110 more than books. I thought. He's done five since we spoke to him. <laughs> yeah, exactly, probably. <laughs> 110 books in 25 years, and we speak to him about how he's managed to do that. But he's written uh, his own stuff, uh, he's written sort of franchise tie-in mm -hmm. for things like Buffy, Hellboy, X-Men... Um, as I said, he's written comics. Done a lot of collaboration with other writers. Yeah. Our listeners might remember season one episode with Tim Lebon. Yeah, it was actually through Tim that we uh, managed to get in touch with Chris. And we we actually discussed that with Chris at the very start of the podcast. Yeah. Uh, and he's also written lots of anthologies. But we're going on far too long. We'll be back at the end of the podcast to uh, discuss all the useful tips that Chris gives in this episode. But in the meantime, just enjoy it and uh, we'll speak to you later. See you later. I don't know if you spoke to Tim at all about it. It was him that, that sort of suggested that you might be up for this. So um, It's his fault if it's a It's his fault, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, well... You know, I assume that um, if Tim likes you guys, I'll hate you. So <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, perfect. That'll work well. Uh, so uh, to begin, I suppose, it, it was writing something that you just always wanted to do? Was that the, the key focus for you? So, um, so basically, when I was in high school, um, I wanted to go to film school, but I wanted to get the best education that I could possibly get before going to film school, I would have gone for graduate school. But while I was at university, um, I took a bunch of creative writing classes. And I'd already been writing short stories and I just got more and more interested in it. And I think that I just didn't have a lot of faith in my ability to do much more than a short story. <clears throat> and then when I was a senior, I read The Light at the End by John Skip and Craig Spector, um, which was their first novel. And at that point, I went, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't that it seemed simple. It was that the, the language and the style and the colloquial sort of storytelling style that Skip Inspector had was closer to me sort of age wise. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, you know, <clears throat> it seemed more um, possible at that point. And so I started writing my first novel when I was a senior in college. And that actually ended up being my first published novel. And oh. so what was the process in getting that published? Did you, did you have to submit it to lots of agents or did it get picked up quite quickly? So um, basically, I, um, I wrote the first 125 pages or so of the novel, which turned out to be Of Saints and Shadows. And that summer, the summer I graduated, I went to... Nikon for the first time. Nikon is a small convention in Rhode Island in the U.S. And I've been going ever since. I've missed it four times since 1989. Wow. It was at Nikon that I met a lot of my horror sort of writing heroes at the time. And I also met um, Laurie Perkins, who would eventually become my first agent, and Ginger Buchanan, who would become my first editor and also would buy a number of books from me over the years. 
So I gave Laurie that sort of 125 pages and she read it and she got back to me and she said, um, you've been in school too long. <laughs> so <clears throat> go and go and get your copy of Strunk and White and study it and try to step back from this. And she, her advice was essentially to study on what I was trying to do and then to sort of print up the 125 pages that I had, sit it next to me and start over sort of with it right next yeah. to me, mm -hmm. but start a fresh file and just do it over. So I studied the elements of style and I sort of ta taught myself to be a better writer. Um, and I read a couple of other things and I did some exercises and then I started over and she took that out with, I, um, sort of a breakdown of the rest of the book. I'd gotten to the sort of the same spot in the novel and an outline and, um, a Ginger Buchanan bought that and a sequel for, um, Berkeley books at the time. Wow. That, that's quite unusual, isn't it? That an agent, you know, it, it wasn't an immediate, right, this is great, I'll go and sell it for you, but actually gave you some feedback, but then sort of stuck by you and then took you on again once you'd, once you'd sort of done what she had suggested. Right. Well, she, I think she, um, I can't speak for her, but my assumption is that she felt like it was there. And I don't think it's that uncommon, actually, because I know that my present agent, Howard Morheim, would, uh, has done the same thing for a number of writers over the years where he sees what it can be. Mm -hmm. um, I, and so uh, I'm sure it's not common, but it's not sort of rare either, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. And is, is going to these kind of writer cons and these meetup cons and stuff like that, is, is that quite a big thing, you think? Is that quite an important thing for an aspiring writer to go to, to network and meet people? Yeah, I mean, look, it's important. It was important for me, for sure, and has been important for me. Um, and I do think that it's important to get to know the people in your community. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've really tried to do over the last five or six years or so is to really work hard at helping to nurture and foster the horror community in New England, uh, um, in the part of the States where I live. But I feel like, um, I, I've been telling people for years, um, that you need to go and learn about the business that you want to be in mm -hmm. and the way, how to conduct yourself and how to be professional. Um, and it doesn't sort of hurt if you get to know who the players are, who are the editors, who are the agents. Um, and the way, the best way to learn that is to go to these events and not act like a jackass. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I suppose that for some writers though, that's, or for some people that want to write, it's quite a, a solitary thing for a lot of people. And I can, I suppose in a convention, it's sort of a friendly, friendly space. Um, but putting yourself out there like that's quite a big step for yeah. a lot of people. It's, it absolutely is. I always say that, you know, writing is a solitary occupation and I'm not a solitary person, but the, the older I get, the more that becomes a bit of a lie because I'm becoming, I think, more solitary rather than less. Um, but it is a solitary occupation and I know it is very difficult for um, for, you know, so many people who become writers are solitary people by nature, mm -hmm. even prior to engaging in any kind of artistic endeavor. But I feel like, you know, educating yourself can happen online, can happen on social media, but there's nothing as valuable as doing that in person yeah. and meeting people in person. You will find like-minded individuals, yeah. especially if you choose the right conventions and conferences to go to, you'll, you'll find yourself surrounded by lots of other people who have made that step, mm -hmm. who have broken through their own solitary nature to try to do that. I mean, uh, almost every convention you go to is made up of people who have at least a percentage of that part of themselves. Um, my attitude toward Nikon was, and I, and I guess here's, my two biggest pieces of advice that I always give about these things is one, um, act like you belong there. Like just don't, yeah. just sort of go in and act like you're, you, you should be there because yeah. you have as, as much a right to be there as anybody else is there. And two, stay up as late as you possibly can. 
<laughs> <laughs> because if there are large spaces where people are congregating, the later you stay up, the more you'll end up talking to the people who are really part of that community. Yeah. Even if you don't talk to them, even if you just hang around and listen and, and sort of let it wash over you. Um, my sort of horror heroes, I read all kinds of uh, um, genres, but horror was my thing then and it still kind of is. And as it's the thing I like to write the most as well. At my first Nikon, um, I stayed up late enough that it was three o'clock in the morning and around me were Charles L. Grant, Rick Howdala, Matthew Costello, Craig Shaw Gardner, <laughs> um, Ginger Buchanan, John Skip, Craig Spector, and I'm sure there are one or two, uh, Rick Howdala, I think I mentioned Rick, I'm sure there are one or two others. Um, and those were the stars of 1980s and early 90s horror. And everyone else had gone to bed except <laughs> them and me. And I was this 22 year old kid and I was just kind of like standing there, like, you know, listening to them talk, chatting. It was fantastic. I mean, it was, it was fantastic. So, you know, uh, I just feel like, yes, it's difficult to break that shell, but uh, it's so valuable. And your, your first book then that you then had out, was that, was that successful off the bat or did you have to work alongside that? You know, publishing is so weird. I mean, success is such a strange word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's this sort <laughs> of in, indefinable thing, right? Because what is now the monolithic um, Random House Penguin, mm -hmm. uh, which I really wish they'd called Random Penguin, or it's now called Penguin. <laughs> it's the Penguin Random House. But at the time, Penguin had many imprints, among them... Um, Berkeley, uh, Ace, and several others. And depending on which imprint you were published with, they had different expectations on your level of success, the number, the sales numbers that you might achieve. So for instance, my first novel of Saints and Shadows was a Berkeley book and they had different expectations. So actually if Saints and Shadows did really, really well by any estimate of how a horror novel should sell and it's still in print now mm. 25 years later wow that's brilliant um, yeah but um it didn't do quite well enough to remain a berkeley book so by the time the second book came out it was bumped, I think it was the second book or the third book. But anyway, it was the second book. It was bumped down to Ace Books where the expectations weren't quite as high, but also the effort to market and sell that book Isn't it, sorry. was not nearly as high. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that law of diminishing returns kicks in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, and again, I mean, that was 25 years ago, but it still is a... Um, this is still a big issue in publishing is, you know, the, 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 you know, expectations versus where they put it, what else comes out that month. You know, it's a, you know, it's a crapshoot most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I suppose nowadays there are, is it fair to say there's a lot more avenues for, um, an author to do their own promotion, but right. that almost lets, lets the publishers off the hook a bit because they just leave it to the authors to do a lot of it. Well, unfortunately, they've almost always left it to the authors. So now, so you know, the, unless it, depending who you are, you know, um, I have to say, I in I've written over a hundred books. It's twenty five years. Um, I've only ever had a publisher pay to tour me once. It was only to California and Texas. Um, <laughs> uh, so different, a, a few signings at each place. And that only happened because I had three books coming out from three different publishers at the same time. One was a graphic novel, one was an anthology I edited, and one was my novel. And um, the graphic novels was with Charlene Harris. So they were able to like all contribute. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that given the hotel rooms where they put me up, <laughs> They could they could easily tour four times as many writers 
if they just put us in ordinary rooms yeah. instead of the fancy rooms. Yeah. Right. And so, did, you know, out of interest, did it make it, did you notice it make a difference to your sales of, of, of that stuff? I, it made a difference. <laughs> Strangely, I do think it made a difference for the sales of the novel, which was Snowblind. Um, but it didn't seem to do anything for the sales of that anthology, which was dark duets. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I think that, you know, if I could afford it, if I had the money and the time, I would just do my own and go all over the place. But I really do think these days that any signing or personal appearance is more valuable as a, as a marketing tool than in selling to the people that you actually see physically. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see those people and to read and talk to them and, and do Q and A's and things like that. But promoting the fact that you're going to do it um, and posting pictures of having been there is just, it's good marketing. Um, and it just reminds people that your book exists yeah. Yeah. in a way that just, so you're not just constantly saying, buy my book, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it must be, is there, is there an element of frustration in, in this whole world you were saying about how certain imprints of certain, certain houses that will put X amount of effort in and then you get bumped down to a lower one and they will do less marketing and there's less returns. And, and you think, well, if you do, if you did more marketing, you'd get more returns and it, it's, you're trapped in this kind right. of cycle. Is that, is that quite annoying? Well, I mean, think about it. Let's think about it this way. So when we did, I did my novel, uh, Snowblind with St. Martin's, who are still my publishers, and I really like the people there. But Snowblind came out. We had a great effort on it. I worked with marketing and publicity and sales. Um, and I had a blurb from Stephen King. That doesn't hurt, uh -huh. uh, obviously. Um, <laughs> and we did a lot of stuff on it, and we had a great result. The book did really well. My next novel for them was a novel called Dead Ringers, which I think is as good as Snowblind. The cover wasn't as good, uh, not even close, but I think the book itself is as good. Yeah. And I kept saying, should I get more blurbs for this? Should we do this? Should we do that? And I kept kind of getting the brush off, like, no, the, the first book did really well. Um, the bookstores will order the same number. But I know, and I was so stupid because as a veteran of these trenches, I absolutely know that that's not true, that that's not how yeah. it works. So what happens is that if I'm a bookshop and I ordered 10 copies of your book, but I sold five, then I'm only going to order five, Yeah. right? But in order to sell five, I needed to order 10, Yeah. right? So, so it's, it's also about the number of books that get onto the shelf. So if you, you know, if you don't market it, if you don't promote it, they're like, oh, yeah, well, last time we did this and that. So they're not interested, you know. Um, so unfortunately, that's the way it goes. Um, so I basically determined at this point that um, every single book, I count my lucky star as if the publisher is doing anything to promote it. And I push them from my end and I do as much as I can on my end because I don't anticipate that support. Yeah. And you've written, you said, over 100 books. I mean, how, how do you go about that? And I know it's 25 <laughs> years, but that's still a large number of books in that time. So, so I don't even know what the number is right now. It's probably about 110 books. Mm. And of those 110 books, a good number of them are media tie-in books. A good number of them are, are collaborative books. Mm -hmm. And a good number of them are also YA or uh, titles. So YA doesn't take as long because they're shorter. A collaborative book actually takes as long. It's actually more work in many ways than writing on your own. But the actual writing time is less. Yeah, It's not half. So anybody who thinks that writing a collaborative <laughs> book is going to take you half as long, you're completely wrong about that. It really probably takes you, it takes you less time, but it probably only cuts off about... 20% of your time off or less. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause it's time consuming. You have to do it because you want to. And the rest of it is, look, when I sold my first novel, my first two, cause they were one contract, I quit a fantastic job. Um, like a job that my aunt pulled my brother aside 
at the family Christmas party that year and said, tell me what really happened. He got fired, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I quit my job. I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have kids. And so my, and my wife was employed. So um, we moved back to Massachusetts, which is where we're both from. And that was it. Uh, I've been writing full-time freelance ever since. And I've treated it like a job and I've done all kinds of writing. I've edited anthologies, I've written screenplays, I've written tons of comic books. I've written essays. I've, um, you know, I mean, just yeah. whatever it is, yeah. you know, um, when I first quit, I was, a, I was also a comic book journalist, a pop culture journalist, making money on the side doing that. I once had a really sweet gig writing articles for Disney Adventures magazine for a dollar a word. That was pretty amazing. You know, 500, 500 word story, 500 bucks. That's wow, good. that's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. So, so yeah. you really, you really jumped in two feet, both feet first, both feet in, what the phrase is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The entire body I, was I jumped, jumped in with this. both feet. That's, the, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm looking for. But, right. But, but honestly, um, I don't recommend it. You know, I, I've told my kids, all of whom can write, if you ever decide you want to pursue writing, don't do, don't try to do it as a career. Uh, I tell people all the time, even when, when Tim Levin decided he wanted to be a full-time writer, I was like, make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> when Sarah, when Sarah Pindro gave up teaching, I was like, make sure you know what you're doing. Of course, <laughs> things have worked out pretty well. Yeah. Um, but I always am very wary. I, I caution all of my friends who write, you know, just make sure you know what you're doing with this stuff. Because once you're on this treadmill of having to earn, mm -hmm. to pay the bills, to take care of your family, to, you know, you've got to balance art and commerce for the rest of your life or go back and get a real job. So there are many times when I envy my writer friends who have real jobs um, which I know that makes most of them want to punch me in the face um, <laughs> because there are lots of times when I'm very glad I don't have a real job when I, you know, I can be unshaven and I, my commute, people ask me in interviews, what's the best thing about being a full-time writer? And I always say the commute, <laughs> it's literally like 12 paces from my <laughs> bed to my desk, you know, but it's a lot. And so how do you write 110 books in 25 years? You have bills to pay and responsibilities, yeah. and and you hustle your ass off is what you do. And and does that, you know, yeah, it, it is. It becomes a, for lack of a better phrase, a real job in in the way right. that perhaps people that dream about writing don't think of it as as a real job in that sense. But does does it being a real job sometimes take the enjoyment out of writing? You know, if you've got a deadline, if you've got to get something done, does, does the enjoyment disappear? Yes. I, I mean, often, you know, and I remind myself that, um, you know, it's it's my dream job, obviously, but that doesn't mean it's not supposed to feel like work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, it is work and it's in most days it's difficult work, but I'd still rather be doing this than anything else. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And and I think. There are, there are, I will say that there are very few days when I, I have one of those writing days where I'm just like completely pumped at the end. Like yeah. that was great. Um, that happens really rarely that I feel that real sense of, of, uh, of satisfaction, mm -hmm. but I still love my job. If that makes sense. Yeah, you know? yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And you've, you've, as well as writing, you, you, you said as well that you do a lot of editing of anthology stuff. And, and how does that work? Yes. I know you've, you've, Hex Life came out yesterday at the time of recording and you've got yeah, and the Twisted Book of Shadows. Shadows so, comes out, yeah. So, so how does that work? What kind of role is that as an editor or as of an anthology? So in most cases, um, and again, both of those, the Hex Life I edited with Rachel Autumn Deering, and Twisted Book of Shadows, I edited with Jim Moore. Um, but, you know, most of the time what it is, is I have an idea for an anthology. I, I put together a list of writers that I think would be great contributors for that particular book. I, I contact them with a sort of pitch on it. And then I, I send the pitch into my agent with a, a list of authors and sort of the same, the, what the idea is. Uh, and most of the time selling an anthology, particularly now, is 
18 editors turn it down and one goes, yeah, we can do that. And here's the pittance we'll pay you. <laughs> and then you sort of, you sort of get them to go up enough that you don't have to hide your face when you tell the author. <laughs> what but that's almost like being a, you're almost like a manager in that sense as well. So there's another sort of job aspect as well. You're, <laughs> yeah. Are you having to chase the writers to, to get the pieces to you and all that sort of stuff? Yes. I mean, I think, I think you have to be a, a, a successful project manager to be able to do any of this stuff, but you also have to be able to edit. Mm-hmm. And you also be willing to edit writers whose work you really respect and who you feel like, how dare I even think mm-hmm. about editing this person? And yet the story needs editing. So you have to be willing to do that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work. I, I love editing. I wish it, I wish that anthologies sold more, mm-hmm. sold better mm-hmm. because I wish it wasn't so difficult to sell them. I've only ever had, I think one that didn't sell, but, um, but boy, it's a pain in the ass. And, um, and you always feel, I always feel like I'm apologizing when I contact people because of the pay is usually really low. Um, it's pro rates, but it's, you know, sometimes it's, I try to always pay at least eight cents a word, but sometimes it's six cents. It's been five cents, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I really like, I, I really like putting something together. You know, I always explain this to people too. When I was a kid in, in school, my whole life I've been this person who wants everybody else to love the things that I love. Right. Yeah. So in school, I'd be like, my mom would have packed me a peanut butter sandwich and I'd be like, this is the greatest sandwich of all time. And I, I literally, I'd be in like the fourth grade and I'd be like, whoever likes peanut butter, raise your hand. Cause I wanted everybody (laughs) excited about my peanut butter sandwich. And I'm, I feel like I'm still that kid. So doing anthologies is like the opportunity to say, this is really great. And you all should think it's great too. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and also it, it goes back to that thing of, um, you know, you said, you said you're not a solitary person. Uh, you're not that sort of cliched solitary writer. So doing an anthology lets you collaborate and you also do a lot of collaborative writing as well. So right. that gives you contact with, with all these other authors as well. Yeah, it does. It's also really interesting too. Well, also because I also always want to express my admiration for writers whose work has impressed me or, or, you know, whose work I admire. But it also is this weird thing because for many years, I think that I have given the impression that I'm a lot less isolated, isolated than I am a lot. And so I collaborate, but I've had perfect strangers ask me to collaborate with them. And I'm like, you don't understand how these things come about, you know, it's, it's because I'm friends with somebody whose work I admire and we're talking about something and then, you know, an idea occurs and you go, we should do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, it isn't, it isn't this sort of like general, Hey, like let's, yeah. you know, it's, it's the blues brothers getting the band back together, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, but I also find that, that I'm, when I, when I, somebody showed me the explanation for the term introverted extrovert or extroverted introvert. Mm -hmm. And that's me. Right. So I'm an introverted person who seems extroverted, but like actually when I'm, I'd really rather just be watching old movies, you know, (laughs) like 1930s, 1940s, golden age of Hollywood movies, really, you know? (laughs) And, and the collaborations that you do, they go beyond just uh, another writer. You've also collaborated with, 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 um, with artists and colorers and inkers and inks inkers inkers, yeah, inkers, inkers. Um, on on your comic book stuff and and you and you've yeah. worked on some high high kind of profile stuff Punisher for Marvel etc. And how did you how did you get into the world of comic books and how did that come about? So I always wanted to uh, write comics. In fact, I was starting to trying to pursue writing comics at the same time I was pursuing writing novels. Uh, in fact, I made my first. Um, my first job writing comics was uh, in 1992, which was the year I sold my first novel. And that was, um, I was on an elevator at my first world fantasy convention with Joe Lansdale. And on the elevator, I asked Joe if he'd be willing to let me adapt to the drive-in as a comic book. Uh, and he said, if I could persuade somebody to, to, to do it, then he would ha- be happy to have me do it. Um, he had absolutely no reason to say yes to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
but he did. And I, I got Dark Horse to say yes to it. It didn't end up getting published by Dark Horse. because even I, I'd written all four scripts and I got paid for them. But Dark Horse, Dark Horse wanted to publish it in black and white. And the contract specified it had to be in color. So Joe said no. Right. It did end up getting done years later by another company. But, uh, but I was hustling in comics the whole time. I lived in New York from 89 to 92. Um, and I was hustling, you know, at comic book conventions and meeting editors and doing all of that that whole time uh, and sort of breaking into comics. And the rest is just like there's so many sort of accidental moments and conversations and just things that happen, you know, in 92, I think, or it might have been 90, whenever it was, when the first issue of Hellboy came out, I was interviewing Mike Mignola for a magazine called Flux. And, uh, and I said, hey, you know, in the, the 70s, Marvel published all these black and white horror magazines and they always had prose story backups. I said, in the next Hellboy miniseries, you should do that. You should have a, a serialized prose mm-hmm. Hellboy story in the back. And I'd never met or spoken to Mike before, but I, <laughs> but he knew my first novel. My first novel was either coming out or about to come out or, or had just come out. And he said, I suppose you'd want to write it. And I said, well, I'd like to read it no matter what, but yeah, I definitely <laughs> would like to write it. So he said, send me your novel, which I did. And then um, he, he got back in touch and said, well, I don't want to do this as a serialized story in the back of the comics, but if you want to write it as a novel, I, I'd like to do that. And I was like, sure, that sounds great to me. And we've been friends and collaborators ever since. Wow. Um, and so I don't know, man, you know, you have to just pick your shots. You have to just ask the question. Um, and in a genuine way, because honestly, I was not asking Mike that question because I wanted the gig. I was asking, I was asking him that or making that recommendation as a fan, yeah. I wanted to see that, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's, I don't know, but I was meeting editors and talking to people and trying to break into comics out of love. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if you think book publishing is bad, uh, comic book publishing will never love you back. <laughs> um, it, 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 is a, is, it is the great unrequited love for uh, almost all comic book creators, there are some select few who really hit it big and have massive careers in comics. But for the most part, it, uh, it's like, it's like crime in old pulp magazines. Yeah, it doesn't it, pay. It, it, well, yeah. Yeah. And they're just, a lot of it is just churn. It just needs stuff out. So that's maybe they are thinking right. behind it. Yeah. They just churn through it. Um, on, yeah. on the collaborative stuff, um, I read um, Blood of the Four, um, which you did with Tim Levin, um, which I, I really loved it. I, I thought it was a great Thank you. fantasy novel that, as Tim stressed as well, it's a sort of one and done, which is unusual for fantasy uh, stories. Right. Um, but how, how do you go about that? What's your process? How do you plan it out? Um, is, right. Does one of you come up with the idea or, yeah? Um, you know, I've, I've collaborated with a lot of people and, and uh, most of the time, that requires a pretty detailed outline to really pull it off. Um, Tim and I work way more organically than most of my collaborations. Um, we will have a, an outline. We're working on another project right now, but we tend to sort of one of us writes a chapter, sends it to the other, and um, the other person will edit that chapter, and then we get on Skype and we talk about that chapter and what what seeing that chapter has made us start thinking about what should be in the next chapter. So we'll have a general idea of where we're going, but um, but it changes and evolves consistently way more than when I collaborate with other people. I just think because Tim and I work way more closely and more fluidly together. Mm-hmm. I think, and I think he said uh, he he said I think that you're he foc- he likes to focus on world building and. You, you're more focused on the characters or the other way around. I can't yeah. remember, but it was something like that. No, you're right. That's, yeah. that's how it typically goes. You know, um, you know, he's, he's looking at the sort of big picture, but I want to know how we get there mm-hmm. and how we get there is always because of decisions characters make. And then we need to discuss 
why they make those decisions and what the fallout of those decisions will be. Mm-hmm. So it really, you know, it really works, you know? Um, yeah, it's, it's always fun because the things that I suggest will springboard him into one direction and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he'll come up with something worldwide and I'll say, yeah, and that means that we can do blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that sounds like, quite, uh, you know, it, if you're, if you're doing that with someone that you admire and is your friend, it sounds like a great process to be involved in. I'm sure it throws up its hiccups every now and again. Um, but uh, do you ever think, does, you know, is there ever a suggestion where someone says, whether it's Tim or someone else saying, what about this? And you're just like, no, definitely no. <laughs> oh, all the time. I mean, uh, everybody I've ever collaborated with will tell you that I'm a control freak. Mm-hmm. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that I always want my way or get my way. But, um, but I think that if you're in a collaborative relationship, it, actually in any relationship, in a romantic relationship <laughs> too, that any sort of debate should automatically be won by the person to whom it matters more. Mm. So like I've debate, I've I've collaborated a lot with my friend Tom Snagoski as well. And we rarely would have any kind of disagreement, but when we got to the point where we had a disagreement over what should happen with a character or a story element, you know, it would always be that, you know, we'd be arguing over it. And then one of us would go, you know what? This matters more to you than it does to me. Let's do it your way. Mm-hmm. And that's how it should be. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, and so, yeah, I think that um, that's part of collaborating is yeah. is understanding your position. I'm, as an American, a lot less polite than Tim. <laughs> <laughs> so, and again, I, where I grew up in the U.S., uh, there are p- parts of the country that are way more polite. But growing up in in, in the Boston, Massachusetts area, <laughs> we didn't grow up. We didn't grow up to be polite. You know, <laughs> uh, we're you know, polite to people on the street. You know, yeah, yeah. But so Tim, where Tim will be, will always be sort of, uh, you know, I'm not sure about this, and um, do you think, mm-hmm. you know, and he'll always yeah. phrase it in a way that's sort of like gently saying, I don't want to do it that way. <laughs> Whereas I'll just go, oh, no, man, that's just fucking stupid. That doesn't work. <laughs> um, which I just always find funny because, you know, um, and it's never it's never like in a dismissive way. It's just in a, yeah, it's it's in a different, uh-huh. you know, it's like it's like it's like building a sandcastle on the beach. You know, I mean, you know, if you're building it, you can see what's going to, what's going to stand up and what's not going to yeah, stand up. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And, um, so anyway. And, and the, the freedom you have when you do your own work or the work you do with Tim, etc. do you find, cause you've done a lot of tie in novels and it's, have you found that your freedom to create worlds that are linked with alien or Buffy, etc. is that, is it curtailed quite a lot when you work with them? I mean, how does that work when you write a tie in novel? Well, look, um, I have many thoughts on writing tie-ins, but as an answer to your question, you need to be able to put the toys back in the box the way you found them. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that's the goal. Yeah. Um, anytime you're doing any kind of uh, media property, you can kind of do anything that they'll let you get away with in the middle. Mm-hmm. But at the end, you have to return it to them the way you found it. Yeah. That was the exact um, thought I had when I listened to the, the radio drama that was, or the, the kind of audible version of the Alien book you, that, that you did, which was, which was excellent. And, and it, was, it was obviously, I'm a massive fan of, of the franchise, and um, it obviously was like it has to fit in this specific part of the timeline, and this can't happen, or if this does happen, this has to go back to here because she needs to be here for the f- third film, etc. And... Yeah, so it it definitely had that feeling of do whatever you want, but then make sure that they're back where they were at the start, at the end. Right. You know, the thing is, look, I would advise anybody who is writing media tie-ins to not take a media tie-in job for the money if you can avoid it. Mm -hmm. Or if you're taking it for the money, seek out a media tie-in job that is something that you love. Yeah. Because when it's something you love, it's actually really easy and wonderful work. It's really fun. Um, and I love threading the needle. I always find that a real challenge. One of my first media tie-in jobs was a uh, 
an X-Men trilogy called Mutant Empire, the first ever X-Men novels. Wow. And all three of those novels take place between one page and the next page <laughs> of an X-Men comic that was published in the 90s. I'm not joking. Like, And it's I think it says it at the beginning of the book. I'm not sure. You know, Marvel doesn't consider those books to be in continuity, but I wrote them to be in continuity. And and that was important to me, that, that it felt to me like it could fit in the continuity. And so I'm, um, with Buffy, it was impossible to do that because we were working concurrently with the show. Right. So you, we were basically doing an, a parallel timeline of Buffy um, that took into consideration everything we knew, but you know, we were sort of ahead of them because yeah. they're, you know, their process is so much faster. So we could write, I could write one thing and the week the book comes out, they could have an episode that completely negates everything that I just did. But you try, you know, you try as, as best you can with that stuff. And, um, and it's fun. Mm-hmm. And, and how, do, how does it work? I mean, how do you get into that kind of area um, for, the, for those out there that might want to to move into that kind of sphere, do, do they approach you and say, we want you to write an alien book or like a, you know, or, or do you have to pitch it to um, them first? Now, yeah, I mean, now they do, but um, if you've never done it before, it's, um, it's hard work to get, you know, in, in my case it was, and look, and again, I got to go back to this whole hustling thing. I mean, you know, if you want to be a full-time writer, there are a million different ways to break into it, but you know, the hustling is a, is a huge thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there are so many writers who, you know, write short stories and then write a novel and the novel comes out and it either vanishes or it does really, really well. And they're, they're super successful and maybe they never have to do the hustle. But, um, you know, in my experience, most of the writers that I know have had to work really hard and, and, and meet people and talk to people and get people to be familiar with, You know, you need to earn a reputation as somebody who can write and somebody who is reliable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you need to be both skilled and professional. Yeah. You know, and so that's that's part of the balancing act. So, for instance, because I was getting interested in getting in trying to break into comics and getting a little bit of comics, comic book work, and I was leaving my job um, in New York. Somebody recommended me to John Betancourt, who at the time was working for Byron Price Multimedia, and they were about to start launching their Marvel novel program. And I was asked if I wanted to come on board as a sort of freelance editor working on that um, line. And uh, of course, I was like, yeah, absolutely. And they ended up sort of changing their minds and deciding they were going to use one of their in-house employees, who's a guy named Keith DeCandido, who's oh, yeah. uh, another writer. And um, and they ended up using Keith, but sort of as a consolation prize, they said, um, but, you know, you can, they were going to let me write one anyway as an editor. They said, but you can still write one of these characters and you can pick whichever one you want. And I picked Daredevil. So I wrote, my very first media tie-in project was the first ever Daredevil novel. Cool. And so uh, that led to X Men, and that led to uh, lots of other things. And you know, and again, I'm talking about hustling, it's like they, they didn't have the X Men license then. But um, some months later, I was in Ginger Buchanan's office in New York. I was visiting New York. I was in her office, and I found out that they had gotten the license for the X Men. And I got in a cab and went to the Byron Price offices and went up to see Keith and basically said. Um, I want to write an X-Men trilogy. You know I can do it. You know I know the characters backwards and forwards. And you should hire me. And he's like, well, you know, um, we have been considering a number of different writers. And we um, we think we know who we're going to go with. We're going we're gonna to go with this writer. And I said, well, you should go with me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I basically made my case. And I explained why, which again, was my knowledge of the characters yeah. and the current continuity. And I'd already written the Daredevil novel and all this stuff. And I said, you know, you should, you guys should absolutely have me do it. And he, while I was sitting there, he wrote an email to his boss basically saying, you know, we should really hire Golden to do this trilogy. <laughs> That's how I ended up doing it. So, wow. you know, the, uh, again, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, you know, 
That's but, that's the Boston kid again there, I think. <laughs> yeah, fuck yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, it isn't enough just to be good at it. Yeah, it yeah. really isn't. You know, there are thousands of people out there who are good at it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you just have to take that step because all the person can say is no. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So... Yeah, that's 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 probably the best advice we've had actually on the, <laughs> on the podcast. Um, it, it, just to go back to planning a bit, you said when you uh, outline, it, obviously when you're collaborating, it might need more outlining. But if you're writing something on your own, are you a big uh, outliner planner beforehand, or do you like to just sort of have an idea and see where it goes? Um, it depends on the project. It, I'm I often have a you know, a decent outline, but my biggest problem is that my outlines usually trickle, trickle off. They tail off at a certain point. And, um, you know, then it's just like, it's the setup part Mm -hmm. that makes the editor who I'm trying to sell the book to go, Oh, that's really cool. And then (laughs) it it doesn't go well. And I (laughs) tend to find sometimes I'll go back and I'll be like, boy, I thought this outline was way more detailed than it is. Yeah. Um, and now I have a lot more work to do than I than I thought I was going to have to do. But yeah, it depends. I mean, if I can, I, let's put it this way. The, the least amount of outlining I need to do in order to get a book sold uh, is how much I will do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But with, with something like a series, like the Ben Walker series, which are your uh, recent uh, books, do you have a sort of overarching thing that you've got in your head or are you just planning one at a time as you go? So it's a, (laughs) it's really interesting actually, because when I Snowblind had come out and I made a new deal with um, St. Martin's and I really wanted to do Ararat next Mm -hmm. and they chose dead ringers to go next. And only after Ararat came out and did well, did they sign up for the Pandora Room, mm-hmm. um, which is the second Ben Walker novel. And then with Red Hands, which is the Ben Walker novel I'm writing now, it's very different from the first two. So no, I don't have, I haven't had a, uh, a long-term plan because you never know whether or not yeah. there'll be a next Ben mm-hmm. Walker novel. Yeah. Uh, that said, I think when I deliver red hands to them, I'm going to go down in December and meet with the team down there and basically say, okay, (laughs) you know, let's discuss what happens next. Right. Um, The other sort of weird thing that's part of that is that I'm currently developing a Ben Walker TV series. Brilliant. And whether that series actually, excuse me, actually goes or not, I don't know. But, I've written the pilot. I'm working on the Bible. I'm almost finished with it. Wow. We have director. We have directors on it. We have um, uh, the producers, the producer team. And I'm supposed to go out the end of October, beginning of November to pitch it to everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're pretty far along in the development process. And that has been an interesting experience, too, because sort of like the Buffy TV series and then the Buffy books, the Ben Walker novels and the Ben Walker TV series don't share a continuity. Yeah. yeah. They share a lot of, they, I mean, obviously they share characters, they share elements, they share, but they don't share, they're, they're not the same world. They're sort of parallel versions of one another. Yeah. So I'm developing a long term plan for the TV series. Right. Uh, that is not the same as the books, the plan for the books, yeah. you know? So it's it's a really weird position to be in. It's new. <laughs> in some ways, is it is it almost easier to to take your book as a launch point for the show, which you can then expand and go into things which you wouldn't have done in the book, uh, compared to adapting a book for a film where you're you're keeping a lot of the content similar. Is it, is it easier to use it as a as a as a launch pad? No, it would have been so much easier to just straight <laughs> up adapt. And and the events of Ararat will take place on the series. Um, but, uh, but for instance, the first episode pilot is, it's like a mini movie all its own. It could have been its own Ben Walker novel, um, the pilot. 
Mm-hmm. It's not an adventure that we've seen in print, and we won't see it in print. But if the TV series gets series gets made, you know, it's sort of its own thing, mm-hmm. um, and I think it's really good. I and I, you know, I don't usually say that, but I like I love it, so I'm really hoping it gets made. Yeah, that that, that would be awesome. Yeah, that's really. Awesome. And what was the last book that you read? Um, I'm currently reading um, The Institute by Stephen oh, King. All right, yeah, excellent. Yeah. What's it like? Uh, I'm about 60 pages in, and so far I love it. So far it feels like classic King to me, which is saying something. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the last film you watched? Um, I watch movies pretty much every day or every <laughs> night. Um, but so I'm... I go through, let's see, I finished watching last night uh, a film, an old film called Undercurrent, starring Catherine Hepburn, uh, Robert Young, and Robert Mitchum. Wow. Um, Because you're you're a big uh, fan of old Hollywood, aren't you? Yes. I watch a lot of old movies. The the DVR is the greatest thing ever invented for people who like, you know, always liked old movies, but just in the last couple of years, I've had a DVR with enough storage space to just like record all this stuff off Turner classic movies. And I actually have learned so much about storytelling and about old Hollywood and about, yeah, I mean, things I learned stuff every day that I didn't know watching these films, which I uh, is great. One of the, like one of one thing for instance, if you watch a bunch of these movies, you'll realize that actually there were tons of women who were writing screenplays at the time? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I see these. I, I see women credited as writing the screenplays or co-writing screenplays in the 30s and 40s, like all the time. And so you see, like the fight that's going on today about yeah. having more quality. And there weren't female directors. There weren't. There were very few female directors. But um, yeah, so it's really, really interesting. But yeah, I love it. I love old movies. And a uh, last TV show? Are you watching a series at the moment or anything box set? Um, I'm watching the French horror series Marianne, which right. is on Netflix. Okay. Which is absolutely brilliant. It's brand new and it's uh, it's really creepy and oh. it's really, really, I recommend it to anyone who likes horror. Oh, I don't think I've actually heard of that. I'll have to check that out. That sounds excellent. Yeah. It's, it's brand new. It's really good. Nice. Cool. We'll check that out definitely. Um, and then we do a uh, quick fire questions. So it's one or other of uh, just first, first thing that comes into okay. your head. Um, yeah. Hellboy related, Ron Perlman or David Harbour? Harbour. Uh, alien or aliens? Aliens. Excellent. Uh, TV or cinema? <sighs> that is, that's actually a really hard question. <laughs> um, cinema. Uh, real book or ebook? Real book. And the last one that all the fanboys fight about is Star Wars or Star Trek. Uh, and there is a right and a wrong answer. <laughs> <in some case. laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, my answer has always been Star Wars. Um, and I feel like I can't remember the name of the film, but there's a movie that opens with these two friends in school fighting over, like literally having a fist fight over this. <laughs> Captain Kirk or Han Solo is what they're fighting <laughs> over. Um, but uh, but I think that you guys need to narrow down the question, right? Like, if we can select which Star which Wars and either. which ah, Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, uh-huh. fair yeah. point. Okay, so... You know, like, classic Star Trek or classic Star Wars, the answer is probably still Star Wars, <laughs> but yeah, classic Star Trek, you know, anyway... <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's it. We'll definitely do that. I think when I want, because yeah, yeah. surely nobody would, nobody would pick the prequel trilogy unless they were absolutely yeah, exactly. insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, unless you, unless the question was which of these films should be burned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hustle, Tarek. <laughs> Every day I'm hustling. Man. Yeah, but that is the that is. All of the writing advice we've been given distilled into one word there, but yep. I think it's an important one. I think it was what really came through for me was the fact that, you know, if you want to become a writer and break in, it's chances are it won't happen just 
writing your story, sending it off to an agent, like everyone seems to think it will, you really do need to make the effort to break in. I think Chris's story there about going to conventions as they are in America, but mm -hmm. I suppose the equivalent would be a, a book festival yeah. or a writing festival yeah. in the UK. Um, meeting people that are working in the industry is so vital. Oh, absolutely. And just talking to them, they're, I think especially, at, well, Chris described himself as an extrovert or introvert, and I think... Probably just got a, a lot of writers. A, yeah, exactly. Maybe without the extrovert part. <laughs> but but um, certainly speaking personally. <laughs> but I think, you know, these people want to, you know, if you're passionate about your story about writing, yeah. they want to speak to you. Yeah. And, you know, he picked up, not only did he get picked up by his first editor and first agent at that convention, he got the Hellboy work when he was interviewing Mike Mignola yeah. and just suggested the idea of writing the books. These, you know, these things don't happen by accident. No. You know, you create your own luck in a way. And if you do, if writing is something you do want to do, yeah, it might not be what you had in mind. You know, you might not have thought writing a tie-in novel or a series of books like that was what you wanted to do, but it is writing. And so many of us get lost in this romantic idea of writing that one kind of perfect book and then putting it out there. But the reality, I think, is very different. No, I think, yeah, absolutely. And I think what he was saying about it being difficult a lot of days yeah. is is probably true. You know, you treat it like a job and like any job, there are days that you'll enjoy more than others, but he'd still rather be doing that than yeah. anything else. And that's what, what it comes down to is what would you rather be doing? Yeah. Would you rather be working your job writing on, on, on the side or would you rather be doing... Yeah, not the exact type of writing you thought you would be doing, but you're writing. And well, you're still doing point? the writing you want to be doing, but you're also oh, having you to do yeah, other writing. Yeah. As well. You know, it, it is, it's turning it into yeah. that job. And the whole time you're honing your craft. Yeah. The more you write, the better you'll become. Yeah. And, and that's only a good thing. And you too can write 110 novels in 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can do that. But um, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, so again, Huge thanks to Chris for taking yeah. the time to come on the podcast. We really appreciate that and really enjoyed that chat and we hope you did as well. Who's on the podcast next week, Tarek? Next week we're chatting to Jim Zub, who is a comic book writer. Yeah, Jim's written uh, for Marvel. He's mm -hmm. written Avengers. He's done his own, create her own stuff for Image like Skull Kickers and Wayward. Uh, he's done a Dungeons & Dragons comic. He's writing Black Panther, I think. Yeah. So he's really uh, big in the industry and even if you're not into comics, I'd encourage you to tune in just to hear about the storytelling process. Yeah. It's the same whether you're writing a comic or a book or a film. You Absolutely. Know. You're taking you're taking the reader from A to B and it's all about creating that world for them and wrapping them up. Exactly. So it's a really good chat with Jim and we hope you tune in next week. Uh, before we go, as always, I'd like to say thank you to Simon Stokes for his help with the audio. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch, please do send us a tweet, which is at right underscore gear or an email to podcast at rightgear.co.uk. And we have a very important month happening right now. Yeah, I know a lot of you who are listening, who are write, writers or, want, or aspiring writers, will be taking part in Nano Remo, as they call it, which is the right, I don't, what does that National, actually stand for? National Novel Writers Month. There you go. So you're meant to write your novel in one month is the goal. I think anyway. that's right, yeah. But certainly write every day. Yes, I believe it's a 50,000 word yeah. goal, but which obviously is a little bit too short. But the idea is that you basically have a, a draft of your story done in the month. Yeah. Um, so if you're doing that, or if you're not doing that, we just want to remind you about page one, the writer's notebook, which is perfect for planning your story out. Absolutely. And that'll help you get to that 50,000 word target. There's a bit more about that after the podcast with our advert. But we just wanted to let you know that we do have a special Nano Remo sale on in the store this month. All the page ones are discounted and you can actually get another discount. Another discount? Another discount as a loyal podcast listener. <laughs> if you use the code POD10, P-O-D-10, you'll get an extra 10% off the sale price. Don't tell Tim, he'll go, he'll yeah, go mad. <laughs> yeah. It, it will bankrupt us, <laughs> but it's worth it, I'm sure. Uh, so go out, grab your notebook, and uh, we hope to speak to you next week. See you later. Bye. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? 
And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here, and our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.